None of us escape being deeply hurt by others as we go through life. We've all been cheated on, lied to, swindled, dismissed, isolated, taken advantage of. And it's into that broken reality that Jesus tells a parable about one of the most difficult things we do in life, and that is forgive when we've been hurt. Join the Discover the Word group in this podcast as they immerse themselves in a story Jesus told about forgiveness, unforgiveness, and the transforming power of mercy. Daniel Ryan Day leads Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, and Bill Crowder in a series of conversations called The Master of Forgiveness in this Discover the Word podcast. And this is Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries, where we invite you to be part of a group of friends that explore the scriptures together. And the passage of the New Testament that we'll be focusing on in this series of five conversations deals with, as I said, one of the most difficult things we at times are called to do in life as a follower of Jesus, holding on to a vengeful, bitter, resentful, unforgiving spirit toward those who've wronged us is what we're most often inclined to do. We usually tend to ask, do I really have to forgive in this situation? Aren't there times when not forgiving is okay? But as followers of Jesus, there's another perspective we need to add to how we think about those times when we have been deeply hurt by someone. A perspective from Jesus, the master of forgiveness, shared in one of his stories we find in Matthew chapter 18. And in this first conversation, Daniel wants Mart and Elisa and Bill to explore the context around the parable that we'll be looking at. It's going to provide an important setting to what Jesus was communicating about forgiveness. So focus on the context is mainly what they'll do in conversation number one. I want to start off pretty personal, and the answer to this might come with a little angst. So I'm sorry for that in advance, but I think this is a really important way to begin this series that we're starting. Share about a time in your life in which you were deeply hurt by someone else. And obviously we don't want to gossip or anything, so you don't have to use names, but maybe just describe a circumstance in which you've been deeply hurt by someone. Yeah, angst is a great word because angst is kind of the side effect of being hurt, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I can think of... um, a time when I was in, actually in the eighth grade. And it will not surprise any of you to know that I was not one of the cool kids. But out of the clear blue sky, I got invited to a cool kid party. Hmm. And about 10 minutes into being there, a friend of mine who was one of the cool kids came over and said, you need to get out of here. The only reason they invited you was to have somebody to make fun of. Oh. And uh, I never, ever forgot that. And hmm. uh So, yeah, I have been hurt deeply and probably other times, too. But that's the one that jumps out at me, Daniel. Hmm. I can think of way too many. You know, I mean, I've shared many times about my dad leaving our family when I was five. And, of course, that's probably the, the most core wound. But I also remember a friend like you just shared, Bill, who said, you know what, I don't want to really be your friend anymore. But I also remember a coworker, and that's the one that's really popping right now, a right armed kind of co-worker in ministry and we served deeply together and suddenly this person went behind my back um, which is really painful i really value loyalty Hmm. and went behind my back and made some decisions that they knew i wouldn't agree with and it just killed me and Mm -hmm. that person ended up needing to leave the position too so then i was really feeling abandoned yeah okay let me give you an example And in saying this, I don't want to blame anyone, okay? I was a speaker at a conference one time, and after my first session, Hmm. I was asked to leave. No, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. How's that? That's awful. That's right. I have never forgot the feeling, you know? Hmm. Hmm. I've never been able to sort it all out. I really Uh, haven't. hmm. It's something you just have to ultimately accept, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yield. Mm hmm. Just hearing these different stories, I can think of situations in elementary school, in fifth grade of getting made fun of, and that still sticks with me. I can think Hmm. of a situation, actually it's kind of a combination of Elisa and Mart's, where I was in a job where part of my job was presenting, and I made a mistake in something I said that I didn't catch, Uh, and it was a funny mistake, 
But the way people would talk about it forever was like, let me tell you about what Daniel said. And so it became like this story. And normally I'm pretty good about letting those things just roll off my back. But in that one, it still has stuck with me. Mm -hmm. The reason I wanted to kind of start there is because all of us have those experiences of being treated sometimes unfairly, sometimes because we make a mistake. And in the story that we're going to spend our time in this week, the context of this story is where someone sins against us or does something wrong. And Jesus tells a parable. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 18. We're not going to look at the story today. We'll spend the rest of the week looking in the story. But I want to talk about the context of this story. And We hear a lot about Matthew 18, especially as it comes to reconciliation with people within the church who have done something wrong, but the context actually begins all the way back in chapter 17, verses 24, with this little story about the temple tax. And Bill, would you just describe what happens in that short little story about a fish and paying the tax? (laughs) (laughs) Well, again, like us, people in that day felt like they were taxed to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, so taxes were a big issue because Rome wanted their cut and the temple wanted their cut as the Jewish authorities in the land. And so you were constantly being drained of money. And so someone comes and accuses Peter that Jesus isn't paying the temple tax that he's supposed to pay. And So Jesus says to Simon Peter, listen, just so that people aren't offended, I want you to go and I want you to throw a hook into the sea and you're going to catch a fish and there's going to be a coin in its mouth and you take that coin and pay your tax and mine. And I've always tried that solution for tax day on (laughs) April 15th, but it's never worked for me. Not so much. (laughs) Yeah. So then we get to chapter 18, and it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then, Mark, how does Jesus kind of unpack that idea of who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Yeah, it's really interesting. He calls a little child to him. And then he says to the people, Unless you turn from your sins and become like a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm Mm-hmm. And what does that mean, becoming like a child? We've had a lot of conversations about that on this program. And, you know, we've unpacked several things. And one I think we all agreed on is just really embracing our vulnerability, our need, our dependency, you know, Mm -hmm. to embrace that. So it's kind of like instead of growing up into being somebody who's without need or independent, instead we need to grow down into somebody who's truly recognizing our need for God and for help. And I think we've seen before, Elisa, as well, that children were viewed as having very little value. Uh, It was the literal, they should be seen and not heard. And we don't even want to see them if we don't have to. So there were times when a child was kind of like the definition of insignificance. And so in a world where we're kind of all, it seems like in some kind of pursuit of significance, Jesus says, you got to kind of set that aside and take that Mm -hmm. role that nobody really likes. Yeah, the Mm -hmm. upside down value yet again, he keeps pointing to. Mm -hmm. And the word that we've often used to describe exactly what you're talking about is humility, right? This Mm -hmm. idea of not holding too tightly to what we think about ourselves, but being willing to lay down even our own desires for others. And so it's Mm -hmm. this, this childlike humility. And then Jesus goes straight from answering that question of who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven by going into this temptation to sin section is how my Bible describes it. It's verses uh, six through nine. That's the part where he talks about don't be a stumbling block to someone else. And then he tells a quick little parable in verses 10 through 14. And Bill, what is that little parable? It's just almost a a retelling of part of the Luke 15 of the shepherd who has a hundred sheep. One of them wanders away and he leaves the 90 and nine to pursue the one. Yeah. And then we get to the immediate context of the story. It starts Matthew 18 verses 15 through 22. These are verses we're really familiar with. And let's just go around the table now that we have the context for this. Elisa, will you start us? Okay. Verse 15. If your brother or sister sins... Go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
If the person still refuses to listen, take the case to the church. And if he or she won't accept the church's decision, then treat that person as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Then Peter came and said, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Or some translations will say 70 times seven, because there's a little nuance in the Greek word there. Hmm. Hey, Daniel, what thread are you seeing? And you've had us read the context here. What are you seeing there, holding it together? Yeah, so what I think is interesting is that when we start, we see this conversation about who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And it's someone that has humility. It's someone who is humble like a child. And that humility, the way it begins to play out, is not only in the way that we recognize our own brokenness, but it's when we see the brokenness in others, the way that we respond to them. Is our goal to point out their sin, point out their brokenness to make ourselves look better? Or as this passage begins to unpack, is the point of pointing out this brokenness to bring reconciliation, to be unified together? So it's not only the humility of recognizing that within us is the capacity to do broken things because broken Mm. people do broken (laughs) things but it's also in the way that we respond to others who have done broken things to us. Isn't there a piece of it too, Daniel, based on those verses right before about uh, dealing with things that could potentially be stumbling blocks to others as well, Mm -hmm. that by helping one another deal with our brokenness, perhaps we're removing a stumbling block from someone else who might really be hurt by that. That's exactly right, Bill. And so this week, as we look at this story that Jesus tells to help answer Peter's question about how many times should I forgive someone that does something wrong against me? In order to really see, I think, what Jesus is saying in this story, we have to have this context of the whole chapter, which is the humility of a child who not only recognizes that all of us have the capacity to do broken things, but it's also in the way that we respond to how others do broken things against us that shows if we truly are humble like a child and we're reflecting the forgiveness of our father who forgives us, or if maybe we still have a little more work to do. You know, it's interesting, Daniel, when I think of the humility of a child in relation to what we're talking about, I think of a a little child as being the one who says, I didn't do it. No way. (laughs) The deceptive Mm -hmm. part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel like humility. It feels like self-protection. Yeah. And that's why that context that I think Elisa and Bill brought in Mm. who this child represents. It's not that this child is humble, but this child is in a humble state. The way that they're treated by the community, they're very well aware of their lack of value. Mm. And it's not that lack of value that actually is weakness for them, but it's where their strength is. And what Jesus is inviting us into is to reflect Not that we come from a place of strength, but that we too come from a place of weakness, just like those children. And that is a great start to what I think will be a great series of conversations about the master of forgiveness here on the Discover the Word podcast. Important to set the parable that we'll be focusing on in the context of how the gospel writer Matthew is telling the story of Jesus. Now, for the rest of our conversations, we're going to look closely at each of the characters that Jesus included in this parable in Matthew 18 and see what they contribute to our understanding of how this story answers Peter's question about how often we need to forgive and what that forgiveness looks like. So let's begin by picking up on what we talked about last time. What did we see last time before we talk about this story that Jesus tells to answer one of Peter's questions? Well, it's a very busy passage. There's a lot of Mm -hmm. stuff going on, and you were helping us to see the humility of a child and the brokenness that creates stumbling blocks in front of other people, and then helping one another deal with our brokenness and our stumbling blocks Mm 
going forward uh, as a body of believers. I think that's where we were, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's this one little couple of verses thing that goes between this runway ramp that we've just that Bill just referenced and the parable it's in verses 19 to 20 of Matthew chapter 18 and and I hear this constantly kind of misquoted it I guess uh, truly whenever two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for it'll be done for them by my father in heaven for wherever two or three gather in my name mm-hmm. there am I with them and you know I hear that constantly about you know this is what happens in prayer, this is what happens when we gather as a body in church. But it's actually kind of a, a segue between what Jesus is teaching about embracing our brokenness and others' brokenness as our need for Jesus, hmm. and a story he tells to explain all that. Mm-hmm. I get a little stuck there going, what? what does he really mean here? Yeah, hmm. I wonder, Elise, if he means that even there, even when you're coming together in a very difficult situation like this, I'm among you. Because hmm. mm-hmm. we couldn't say that he's not among us in other occasions okay. when mm-hmm. two or three gather together, right? But at the same time, he's also not saying that if there aren't two or three people, then you can't yeah. worship or you can't pray. Right. It seems to be a very specific kind of moment where when you're dealing with the most painful things in the life of a church congregation, that it takes the group and that Jesus is engaged and involved with that. I would hate for that power and authority of confronting and challenging brokenness to land on any one person. Mm -hmm. Uh, It really requires the wisdom of more than one, and Jesus joins us in that moment, right? Yeah, and so what you're saying, Mark and Bill, is that even there, or especially there, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so in that context, it makes sense that Peter looks at Jesus and goes, okay, I want a little bit of clarity here. (laughs) If another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive them? And there was a tradition within Judaism that if someone sins against you three times, you forgive them. But when they sin against you the fourth time, you don't. And so Peter's already spent enough time with Jesus that he's like, should I forgive them seven times? So (laughs) the typical times two plus one, Mm -hmm. right? So like seven times. And Jesus responds by saying, no, not seven times. I tell you 77 times. In other words, continuing to forgive. Mm -hmm. And so in typical Jesus fashion, continues his response to Peter with a story, with a parable. And we've spent a lot of time talking about parables, the idea that a parable is not like an Aesop's fable that comes to one point, but is an immersive experience where we're invited into the story to touch and to taste and to smell and to listen for maybe what character that we identify with at a certain time. And it may change depending on where we are. And Daniel... Isn't it important to remember that whenever Jesus is talking, there's always a heart behind it. There's Mm -hmm. always an intent, a spirit, and it's never just the words by themselves. And I think in this case, he gives us his heart ahead of time. I want you to be so forgiving that you just continue to forgive and continue to forgive and continue to forgive. And that's the context of this story. So let's read it. It's Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35. It's a little longer, but I think it's important for us to read the story. So, Mart, if you'll start for us, Matthew 18, verse 23. Okay. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. Verse 26, at this time, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. He was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave 
as I had mercy on you? And then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Serious stuff here. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to just focus in on the guy that in my translation, it says 10,000 talents. Mart, your translation said it a little differently, which was really helpful, which is what? Yeah, like millions. Millions he of dollars. Millions. Yeah, you may have a note in your Bible if you're following along that a talent's about 15 years of labor. So 10,000 times 15 years of labor. <laughs> so we also saw the term denarii. How much is that? That's just like a day's wages. Yeah. Yeah. So the other slave that this slave runs into or this servant runs into owes 100 denarii. So about 100 days versus... So you're contrasting. Jesus yeah, there's is a contrast there. Okay. Yeah. So this guy owes millions of dollars. What else do we know about this guy? You know, Jesus doesn't tell us this, but he must be in some kind of a of a management position mm-hmm. where he's responsible for stuff to be that far in debt. I mean, a normal day laborer type slave could never accumulate that kind of debt. So it would seem as though, and I don't want to read more into it that's there, Daniel, but it seems as though he must have been in some kind of role where his master had placed great trust in him. And it's not yeah. just the money that's gone, but that trust is gone as well. Mm, that's good, Bill. There's two schools of thought. One is that Jesus may just be using hyperbole to say this guy owes a whole bunch. Or, as you just mentioned, there's some scholars that say there was a role for a servant where they would be kind of a tax collector for a community. And since this is a king reconciling accounts with his servants, that this could have been a servant that was in charge of collecting taxes for a region. And so maybe he wasn't able to do that. He wasn't able to bring in all the tax money. Yeah. And what's interesting is that if he works for his master, then he has to earn from his master the money to pay back his master, which seems Mm -hmm. like an impossible situation. Yeah. And in this impossible situation, how does the king respond? He has pity on him, and he releases him. He cancels the debt, and he lets him go back to a life that's without debt. Yeah, and so as we can imagine, this servant goes out of the king's presence, probably rejoicing in some ways, but then he runs into another guy, and what happens? Well, it's not pretty. I mean, he goes to a guy who owes him comparatively a pittance Mm -hmm. and says, pay me what you owe, And he gets physically violent with him, and he throws him into prison. I mean, Mm -hmm. again, if Jesus is using hyperbole in contrast, he's doing it just about as well as it can be done. Yeah. So this servant comes out after getting his debt forgiven, and then he goes and he grabs this other servant by the throat and says, pay me what you owe. And that fellow servant looks at him and uses the same language that he used for the king, have patience with me and I will repay you. But instead of showing mercy... He throws this fellow servant in jail. So Peter's question was, how many times should I forgive? And then Jesus tells this story. How does this aspect of the story help us understand how Jesus is answering Peter's question? What I see in it is that it would never be okay to refuse to forgive someone with the sincerity of heart, because the debt of all of us is more than any of us can pay. And so when does that ever run out? No, it never does. Mm. We constantly Mm. live in that state of need before God. Mm. I think it also relates to the question Peter asked Daniel in the fact that those of us who have experienced forgiveness should be the first to forgive. Yeah. Because in that way, we reflect the heart of the king who's forgiven us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the person who asks for mercy. I think it's important to show that we're not talking about somebody who's spitting in your face. It's somebody who is asking for mercy. That's good. Yeah. And of all people, the slave who had just been forgiven should have understood the plight of his fellow slave. Yeah. He should have felt empathy for him. And I think that relates back to the context that we put this whole story in, which is to not only understand our own brokenness, but when other people act in broken ways to us, to respond not in harshness, but in the same kindness and compassion that God has shown us. Okay, how the forgiven but then unforgiving person in this story enters into the answer to Peter's question about how often we're required to forgive is what Daniel and Elisa and Mart and Bill focused on in that conversation.
and we'll explore how the other characters contribute to the answer in our conversations going forward. Well, this is the Discover the Word podcast from Our Daily Bread Ministries. And before we get back to our study, I want to tell you about another resource that you may find helpful. It's a recent documentary from the Our Daily Bread Ministries film crew called In Pursuit of Peter. Of course, Jesus' disciple Peter was the one who asked the question that Jesus told this parable in response to. And so in this six-episode video documentary, you'll learn more about Peter by visiting the places he lived and traveled and discovering how he was transformed by Jesus' teachings about things like forgiveness and by his relationship with the risen Savior. You can find a link to watch the In Pursuit of Peter documentary on YouTube when you go online to our discovertheword.org website. And now let's continue our study called The Master of Forgiveness on the Discover the Word podcast. We're in the middle of discussing this parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 18 to answer a question that Peter asks. What is that question that Peter asked? How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And he says yeah. up to seven times. Mm-hmm. And how does Jesus respond, Mark? He makes a comment that makes it sound like in an unlimited number of times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, some translations even go so far to say 70 times seven with the idea being perhaps that by the time you get to that point, you've stopped counting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there's this question that Peter asks. Jesus responds with a shorter answer, but then goes into this story to help unpack the answer that he's giving Peter. It's a pretty interesting story. And so we're going to read it again. But this time, uh, I'd like us to think about a different character. Last time, we talked about how parables are an immersive experience where we're invited in to see and to taste and to touch and to hear what's going on and to be involved in the story and see how that story transforms the way that we see God, see others, see ourselves. And last time, we kind of focused in on the servant who was forgiven a great debt but then ran into a servant that owed him money and he grabs him by the throat. Hmm. And today I want us to focus on the servant that was grabbed by the throat. And so as we hear the story, as we read it together, think about that servant and what we learn about him. So this is Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. And Elisa, if you'll start us. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me. I'll pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him, and he forgave him his debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay his debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Hmm. In our last conversation, we talked about this servant that had been forgiven so much. And then he leaves the king's presence and goes out and he runs into another guy. And what are some of the things that we learn about this other guy? You know, just one thing before we go there, if this doesn't derail us, I hadn't noticed this. In verse 23, when the parable starts, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. The focus as Jesus begins the parable is on the king wanting mm-hmm. to settle accounts with his servants. And so in our last conversation, we looked at the, the one who owed him a zillion dollars and the king forgave him. And now we're looking at the one who owed him a zillion dollars and was forgiven going and holding another person accountable. Mm-hmm. That's a tiny little nuance. What do you think that's about? 
Yeah, so that's really good, Elisa, and that's where we're going to end our series <laughs> is focusing on the king. <laughs> and so I just ran straight to the finish line. No, okay, that's okay. that's good. <laughs> but I'll invite people to hold on to that thought for our last conversation, and that's the reason this series is called The Master of Forgiveness because this story is communicating something about the master, about the king. Thanks, Daniel. But for today, let's focus on as you just said. So the king is settling with a servant. This servant goes out and decides he's going to settle an account with a different servant. What do we learn about the guy? Well, his debt is smaller than mm-hmm. the guy who's holding him accountable. Much, much smaller in contrast. Yeah, so 100 denarii. How much is a denarii? Like a day's wages. About a day's wage. So a good third of a year of labor. So it's not too small of an amount. It's still a pretty good sized debt that would be hard to pay off, but it's not nearly as big as the other guy for sure. Mm-hmm. Mart, what else do we see? He begged for patience. He mm-hmm. begged for mm-hmm. mercy. Yeah. He's begging for mercy as he's being grabbed by the throat. As he asks for mercy, you pointed out in the previous discussion, Daniel, that uh, he uses the exact same language Mm -hmm. that the first servant did when he was talking to the king. And, And I think that's very intentional, too. Yeah, that's right. Have patience with me and I will repay you. I promise I'm going to pay you back. Just give me more time. Hmm. And for the first servant who owed the king all that money... When he asked for forgiveness, the king forgave him the debt. He didn't just give him more time. He fully forgave. Mm -hmm. But this time, when this other servant is asking the guy that owed a lot for forgiveness, what happens? He's refused. And he has him thrown into prison until he can pay the Mm -hmm. debt. And how do you pay a debt when you're in prison? You can't work. Yeah. Daniel, isn't it true that in ancient times that you could earn income in prison so that you could work your way out of whatever obligation might have put you there. So it was a possibility, but it sure wasn't an easy path. Or in this case, it certainly wasn't the kind of path Mm -hmm. that could have been taken. And this servant is most likely a servant of this king as well. And so he's probably present because he also owes the king something. And so not only is he going to be trying to pay off what he owes the king, but now he would also be in prison trying to pay off this other servant. So there's this double layer here. What else do we see? You know, it's interesting. The other servant is a married man. He had wife and children. In this case, we're not told that, but we're told that he had friends yeah. Yeah. who didn't yeah. like what they were seeing. And they advocate for him, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that brings us to one of the words, I think, that is repeated over and over again that helps us understand one of the pieces we're supposed to understand in the story that Jesus is telling. And that's the repetition of, in my translation, the word fellow. So he came upon a fellow slave, then his fellow slave, when his fellow slave, on your fellow slave. So there's this Mm. repetition of fellow. And as Mm. we said last time, of all people, the guy that owed a lot and was forgiven should have understood the plight of his fellow slave who Mm. owed Mm. a lot less. How does that strike you, this repetition of the word fellow? Well, it's an interesting word because a lot of times when we see the word fellowship, it's the word koinonia, which means to have in common. Mm -hmm. But here it's a different kind of word. And as I understand it, Daniel, the word fellow slave means slaves together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a bond that they share. It's it's Mm -hmm. almost a communal kind of thing. We're not just fellow slaves. We're slaves together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how might that help us in the context that we talked about where this story falls, this story of brokenness, right? This context of us becoming humble like a child. How does that context help feed into that idea of we're all in this together? Yeah, there's a way in which Jesus continues to underline that we all need forgiveness. And even after that first servant who had this horrific debt was forgiven the debt, the debt was canceled and he was let go. Even after that, it's like he forgets all about that. It's like he forgets his condition. And so he approaches someone who owes him money as if he's never been in a spot Mm. himself. And it's like Jesus wants us to never lose sight of our own Mm -hmm. indebtedness to our God, Mm -hmm. but instead to function from that. And that doesn't mean we wallow in how awful we are. Maybe it means we live in how forgiven we are. And so therefore we Mm. can be compassionate and forgiving to others. Yeah. It's very similar to 
the event that happens in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus goes to the home of the Pharisee for dinner and the sinful woman comes in. And when the Pharisee shows a very harsh attitude toward the woman, Mm -hmm. Jesus tells another parable about people with two different debt loads Mm -hmm. and forgiveness. And part of the big takeaway of that story, like this one, is that no matter how much you owe, both are debtors. Mm -hmm. In both cases, both of them are debtors. And you're both coming out of the same community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this story, you know, last time, maybe we're in a place where we related to this servant that owed a lot and was forgiven that. But there's sometimes in our lives where we relate to this guy today. And so as this forgiveness begins to trickle down from the master to the first servant, and then should have trickled down from that servant to the next servant, we're the ones who have the opportunity to not only be those who have received forgiveness, but also those who can show forgiveness. We've been talking through this story that Jesus tells that answers Peter's question of how many times I should forgive. But Peter's question came out of its own context. And what was some of the context that we saw that Matthew 18 gives us before Jesus tells this story to answer Peter's question? Well, I was handling problems in the community of believers, mm-hmm. the process for working through that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he talked about, uh, in answer to the question, who's the greatest in the kingdom, he pointed to a child who's vulnerable and innocent and, uh, and in that day was viewed as having little to no value. And he said that's the place of greatness is mm-hmm. to take that low place. Mm-hmm. Well, Peter asks a question about how often do we need to forgive? Do I always stay in this lowly position of need? And Jesus tells a parable to say, yeah, pretty much. Let's realize we're all broken and we're all in need of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And how much we've been given. Yeah. And I think in the context of one of our earlier conversations, Daniel, Mark reminded us that this forgiveness is not some kind of a cheap deal that you just throw around like a magic wand that's supposed to fix everything. It's really a response to someone who takes responsibility Mm -hmm. for wrongdoing and for the hurt that they've caused others. And when they take ownership of that, then we can really freely move to forgiveness and reconciliation. It's a really important and I think fairly dense passage that you've got us wading deeply into. And that idea of reconciliation, of bringing together that you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. is a huge part of forgiveness. It's not just about acknowledging a wrong, but it's movement toward a right relationship both our right relationship with God, but then when others sin against us or do broken things against us, it's also about doing all we can to be in reconciled relationship with those people too, which isn't always possible. No, and that's a good point because even answers like this that the Lord gives are not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everybody's got a a little different way of of having to work through issues Mm -hmm. of hurt and forgiveness. And there's only so much that we are personally responsible for. You know, I think we've been looking at that. We're responsible to ask for forgiveness. We're responsible to forgive others. But we can't make others forgive us. No. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it so complex is because we're just such messed up people (laughs) that we can find all (laughs) kinds of ways to ruin this. I mean, I think at its core... Forgiveness isn't there necessarily to simply make me feel better. Yeah. It's there to try to move toward the kind of reconciliation you're talking about, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. when there's the kind of opportunity for that loving release. Mm-hmm. And if there's not that opportunity, it doesn't mean that we're we're free to be bitter no. you know, or hopeless. And it also doesn't mean that we're supposed to stay in a situation that's abusive or something like that either. Right, yeah. A story like this has been used in a negative way to say that someone, well, you should just be more forgiving. Yeah. Sure, they may need to be forgiving, but also need to get out of a situation that they're in. So there's Mm. all those complexities that make a conversation Mm. like this and a story like this so tricky. And I think that's part of why when Jesus tells a parable, he's not asking us to come to this one point. Middle Eastern parables are about getting into the story and seeing maybe who we relate to at a moment or Mm. feeling the emotions of the moment that we see happening in the story. They're immersive experiences invited into the story so that we see God, ourselves, and others differently. And the first two times that we've read through this story, we talked about 
two different servants, one who owed a lot and was forgiven, but then did not show that forgiveness to someone else. One who owed a little and wasn't forgiven and was thrown in jail until he could pay back his debt. But there's another set of characters in the story that we're going to talk about today, and that's a a group of fellow servants. Again, this is Matthew 18, beginning in verse 23. And Mark, would you get us started? Okay, Jesus says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. And in the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars, He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. Verse 26, at this point, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I have had mercy on you? And then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. And when Mark reads that last statement, Daniel, it makes me really glad that you preface this by saying we're not supposed to land on just one idea here, because Mm -hmm. if somebody landed on that last sentence as their idea, it could, I think, misrepresent the heart of God. Yeah. Next time, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the heart of the master, uh, which I think reflects the heart of God. But today, there's one more group of people that we need to talk about, and that's the group of fellow servants. So what is their part in this story? If we go back on our first conversation, you had us looking at the context, and part of the context was the process by which a group of believers deals with situations in their community of faith, Mm -hmm. and it, it involved the fact that there's not one person who does this, but there has to be a group of people who are engaged in the process. And it seems like Jesus is really bringing that to the forefront, that this is not just a one-person task. People need to become involved in accountability and in trying to help produce reconciliation. And there were witnesses to this. Yeah. And I think we all are witnesses to these kinds of interactions around mm-hmm. us all the time. And maybe, Daniel, that's why the onlookers, the fellows are included here. I mean, every mm-hmm. day, all day in our interactions, we're always the onlookers. We're always the participants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think the way that they respond, these onlookers, these fellows, should be kind of an indication of how we should feel and respond when we see brokenness. What is the emotion that they experience? Well, it's interesting. Some of you were saying that um, your translation said they were greatly distressed. And and every time we read that verse, I've been thinking, wow, because mine says when the other servants, the fellow servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. That Mm -hmm. word really grabs me. You know, we've talked on previous programs about so many times in the narrative in the New Testament, you see this little pattern where somebody sees something, they feel something, and that forces them to do something. Mm -hmm. And I see that pattern here. They saw what the first servant, the one who was forgiven so much, did. They felt something, whether it was outrage, like Elisa says, or whether they were greatly distressed. And then they did something. They went to the king and said, this is not right, and they pled Mm -hmm. for justice. And it's this very deep level of emotion where they're affected by what they've just in this case, seen, so much so that, as you said, it's leading this fellow group of servants to action, to go to the king. How does this, again, help us see Jesus answering this question that Peter asked, how often should I forgive? How do the onlookers play into that part of the story? There's something in this that really illustrates the value 
of all of the body of Christ, the church, being involved. It's an illustration of what Paul will later say, you know, that the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. You know, we need each other desperately. Each one of our Mm -hmm. observations and conclusions counts. Yeah. And I wonder if there's an extent to which the onlookers also can help us think about those outside the church that watch brokenness happen within the church. Mm Mm-hmm. And then instead of seeing reconciliation, they watch us grab each other by the throat and not show the same mercy that we say that we believe in from God. So there's almost like two layers here of not only within the church do we have a responsibility to when we see injustice, when we see lack of mercy and compassion calling it out, but also realizing that the way that we treat one another when it comes to forgiveness may be the best way that we can both represent who God is to the world and represent who God is to one another. An interesting aspect of this parable in Matthew 18 that Jesus told that often gets overlooked. But as we've seen, these onlookers, these fellow servants, these witnesses to the forgiveness and unforgiveness have a powerful lesson to offer. You're listening to the Discover the Word podcast with Marty Hahn. Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. And now in this final conversation, they're going to zero in on the character in the story that represents God, the King, the Master, the Master of Forgiveness, and discover what can transform us into the forgiving kind of people that God wants us to be. All right, I'm going to ask you an easy question, okay? What have we talked about in our last few conversations? (laughs) Well, we've kind of been skimming the surface. There hasn't been a lot of depth there. Um, (laughs) I don't know where you guys were. This has been a very dense but also helpful conversation about forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. Peter asked Jesus this question, how many times should I forgive? And Jesus gives us a smaller answer and then tells a story to help answer Peter's question. And all of that came within a context, though. And what was the context that we saw? Well, it had to do with dealing with problems in the church. And if I remember correctly, that's the first time the word church appears Mm -hmm. is when Jesus is unpacking how you deal with interpersonal problems within the life of the church. And yet it's interesting. He tells a story which is a little bit different than the kind of process that he outlined for brothers and sisters to handle a a difficult situation among themselves. Mm. This one's about a king. So it probably requires a different kind of process for a different kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, Mart. I wonder, too, if maybe in the one case he's giving us a process that we can follow, but in the story he's giving us what the heart needs to be behind Mm. the process. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's And I think that word heart is really important because, at least in my translation, when we get to the end of the story, in fact, the end of chapter 18, the last word is heart. And that's Matthew 18, verses 23 through 35, which is where we see this story that Jesus tells. Part of the reason maybe the story doesn't match the process of confront and then confront with someone else and then confront with the church is because of what the point of a parable is, right? So in Middle Eastern culture, how does a parable function? I think you've talked about it as being something we immerse ourselves in. So he's inviting them to immerse themselves. He's inviting us to immerse ourselves, even if it's a different Mm. culture than what we're used Mm. to. What do we see in this story? And where do we see ourselves in this story? And how might God Mm -hmm. be speaking to us? Yeah. One of the things that we've repeated over and over again is when we get into these parables, we begin to see ourselves, we begin to see others, and we begin to see God differently. And there's one character we haven't focused on in the story, which I think really captures the heart of who God is, and that's the king and the master. And so I'd like us to read through the story one last time. And as we go through, think about who this king is and how he acts especially toward the servant that owes him a lot. And then after he forgives debt, how does he respond when he sees that servant not show that same mercy and forgiveness that he showed? This is Matthew 18, verses 23 through 35. Mark, will you get us started? Okay. Jesus said, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. Mm. 
In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and and everything he owned to pay the debt. In verse 26, At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he refused, and then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all of the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So what strikes you about this king or this master? Well, obviously, he shows a patience with the servant's shortcomings, with his failures, with his wrongdoing. It's a different kind of patience that he expresses. I mean, the reality, he says he could sell the servant and his wife and children and take care of the money need. He doesn't do what I guess was within his right. Instead, he shows Mm -hmm. mercy and forgives. Yeah, and... We've talked about how much this particular servant owed, millions of dollars. We've talked about how 10,000 talents, a talent's about 15 years labor. So 10,000 times 15 years labor. It's a debt this guy will never be able to repay. Mm -hmm. And he begs for patience and I will repay you. And the king fully forgives the debt entirely. But then what happens? Well, he refuses to forgive a fellow slave who owes him comparatively little. Yeah. And so he grabs another slave by the throat, throws him in jail. Some fellow slaves see this. They go to the Lord and they tell this master, this king, about what happened. Bill, read for us verse 33. I think this really describes kind of the heart of the anger that this king Mm -hmm. is feeling. The king says to what's often referred to as the wicked servant, Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? Hmm. There's almost this expectation that that mercy and that grace will be so amazing for you that it'll overflow out of you to others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great word picture that you just used, Daniel. It's as if you would picture the servant as as a, a cup or something that the king is pouring his mercy into. But instead of really going into him, it just kind of splashes right back out. It leaves mm-hmm. him unchanged. And that mercy is expensive. Um, forgiveness is expensive. Grace is expensive. We know that, you know, God gave his son, Jesus, and Jesus knew that that would happen in order to provide for it. And, and how this must have broken the king's heart in this mm-hmm. story to just see it wasted the way it was. Yeah. Hmm. What would you say if someone said, but you know what? It's almost like the king, he throws away his good example by acting with a kind of severity that you wouldn't expect of God. Mm -hmm. I think we have to remember this is a parable. It's not a story that directly is describing what God is doing in the world. Mm -hmm. It helps us see the world and see God differently. And so I think the king's response here is to show that when he offered this full forgiveness and mercy of the debt, this graciousness, this patience, the expectation is that that would actually cause a change within that servant that received the patience. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that change, do we? No, and, and I think that's such an important idea, Daniel, because, I mean, all of us stand in need of mercy, all of us stand in need of forgiveness, and all of us stand in need of transformation. And part of what God desires to do is not just say, okay, to use what Elisa sometimes says, bibbidi bobbidi boo you're forgiven. <laughs> it's not just the past is over. It's the future should be transformed because of what God's doing in our lives. We've said so many times, everything that God does, whether it's his expression of justice or mercy, 
or anger is always motivated by something good rather than evil. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we're, yeah. scriptures mm-hmm. say that our God is a consuming fire. And I think that consuming fire is his love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He cares enough to hold us accountable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And where that really sinks in for me is who was the person that asked Jesus this question? How many times should I forgive? Peter. Peter. Okay. Mart, read for me Second Peter 3, 9. And as you're turning there, the slave comes to the king and he says, have patience with me. The other slave comes to the slave that uh, he owes money to and says, have patience with me. I wonder if that word patience sunk in to Peter's heart, transformed his heart in a very particular way as he reflected back not only on this story, mm. but on who God really is. Would you read that for us, Mart, at Second Peter 3, 9? Yeah, Peter is writing about God's patience. And he says, God is being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. Hmm. So the heart of our Father is a heart that shows forgiveness even when we owe more than we could ever repay. And with that forgiveness comes an invitation to be those who also see others as ones whom we can show that same love and mercy to that God has shown to us. And so as Jesus answers, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And Jesus gives an answer that kind of makes it seem like, no, you need to continue this spirit of forgiveness. Because the spirit of ongoing forgiveness for others is the same patient, forgiving spirit of my Father who shows patience and mercy and forgiveness to you. This has been a study called The Master of Forgiveness on the Discover the Word podcast with your study partners, Mark Hahn, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. Thanks for studying along with us. Discover the Word is the small group Bible study outreach of Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Discover the Word. encourage you to explore other studies with the group on our discovertheword.org website. And thanks for remembering that Discover the Word is a listener-supported show. It's listeners like you who help make this possible. Your financial support allows Discover the Word and Our Daily Bread Ministries to make the life-changing wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to literally millions of people around the world. And so if you'd like to make a one-time donation to support the ministry or give a monthly gift as a Discover the Word partner, simply follow the easy steps online at discovertheword.org, click the Donate tab, To explore your options at discovertheword.org. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministry.